My guest today is Tootie Damien. Tootie, how are you today, sir? Uh, good, thank you. Uh, it's nice good to, to see your nice face. to be back. Yeah, yeah. I know it's back. It's been a, it's been a couple of years since we've seen each other in person in uh, Transylvania, where you're from. That's where right. You live. <laughs> and um, and I miss I miss you, and I miss Cluj Napoca. Well, we'd we'd be glad to have you here back again as soon as. Um, the situation allows it. I hope so. Yeah. What do you do, Tudi? For a living? Uh, I I um I'm a certified ethical hacker, which means I hack people and companies that pay me to do it. Um, that's basically legal hacking. Um, I also deal with everything around digital transformation, moving to the cloud, and making sure that. Um, you use the right technology for the right uh, purpose, um, and that technology doesn't become something that you do every day, that you can focus on your business, and technology is just uh, something in the background that helps you do your job better. So that's that's what I've been focusing on for the past 10 plus years or so, uh, mostly public cloud and security. I've been doing a lot of stuff before that um, in IT. I've been, I had my first computer back when I was six and uh, wow. started doing programming. Back then it was basic on a, on a spectrum machine with magnetic tapes and all of that stuff. So wow. that's, that's how I got started. You started way younger than I did. Um, yeah, but then I, I moved away from programming and um, around university. Um, I used to do web development back then and uh, um, a lot of stuff around that. But I discovered that infrastructure, servers, security interested me more. I found that a lot more fun uh, and challenging at the same time. So excellent. I've, I've done that since. Now you mentioned that you're a certified ethical hacker. There's a lot to unpack in that phrase yeah. you know, let's, let's start with hacker hacker you know maybe largely thanks to hollywood has sort of got a yeah. bad reputation when people think hacker they think of the, the bad guys the guys that are trying to break into your system and I, th and I think in this context that's sort of what you mean when you qualify it with the word ethical yeah. is that fair yeah that's that's correct um so the the entire cyber security uh scene splits if you will, splits the hackers into um, what are called white hat and black hat hackers. And this goes back to the old Western movies where the good guy always wore a, a white hat and the bad guy always had the, the black hat. And you knew more, who was the good more guy. More Hollywood references. I love it. Yeah, more <laughs> Hollywood references. But it's it's trying to move away from that idea that a hacker is someone in a hoodie sitting in a basement with like seven monitors with the matrix screensaver running in the background and you've got that he's pressing three keys and he's got a a red access denied message and he says wait a minute and like 10 seconds later he's got a green access granted kind of a thing um so the the whole hollywood um idea of what a hacker is and what a hacker does is uh, fairly skewed from what what's going on in the real life. But at the same time, it's not that far um, away from how easy it is to, to do certain things if you know what you're doing. Um, the ethical part is all about using that information, the same kind of stuff that a hacker knows, but using it for a for a noble purpose to help people to help companies protect themselves against known types of attacks and hackers and the bad guys the bad hackers and it's in essence it's doing a lot more than than a bad guy does because you need to know what the bad guy knows but you also need to know how to prevent those attacks how to protect yourself against those attacks and a bad guy doesn't need to know that he just needs to know how to get in, how to do whatever he wants to do, and get out. Um, so it's it's a lot more challenging, 
but at the same time, it's something that allows you to sleep better at night, knowing that you didn't do anything illegal. In fact, you actually helped um, put those uh, tools and that knowledge to good use. It's And the, the knowledge itself is a tool, just like a hammer. Like you can build a house with a hammer, you can hit someone in the head with a hammer. It's all about how you use the tool. It's not about the tool itself. So yeah, the knowledge itself, it. yeah. The, the knowledge itself is not bad. Knowing how to hack into stuff is not bad if you only do it for a good purpose or if you don't do it at all, right? You don't break into stuff for the sake of breaking into stuff. And the the whole ethical side of things just goes down to how you use that knowledge. Like you walk down the street, you see a house that has its door ajar. Now you can go there, you can knock on the door or ring the doorbell and tell the owner, hey, you know, your door was open. Or you can just go in and take a look and see what's there and then quickly get out. Or you can go in and call all your friends and tell them, hey, there's a free TV here. There's beer in the fridge, right? You do whatever, cause havoc and leave with whatever you want. So it's it's all a matter of how you um, how you decide to act knowing what you know or discovering what you discover. So, so in the context of an ethical hacker, what are things that uh, a hacker can do that are good or ethical? Well, anything around protecting usually customers and companies um, and themselves and their friends and their family against uh, common attacks, common threats that you might encounter in today's world out there on the internet, Everything nowadays is connected. Even maybe your fridge uh, is connected to the internet and might be sending out spam. Like there's been cases in the past where smart devices have been hacked into and they were used to send out spam. So your TV, your uh, weather controller device that tells you how many degrees are outside or whatever. If it's connected to the internet, it's something that people out there can probably hack into. So it's all about trying to prevent and detect those things um, and also knowing how to respond to when something bad happens. It's not about if it happens, it's more about when it happens and being prepared for that and helping people. Yeah, so, so what are some of the common uh, threats from attackers? Um, the, the problem is that these kinds of attacks or these kinds of threats rarely change fundamentally. It's more about people not knowing how to use technology or using it wrong. And the attackers are going for either, um, something that people usually do and they do, um, in a way that's easy to, to exploit like the way you set your passwords and attacks against passwords are a common thing. It just, it, you, you just see a shift in how those attacks works, work, sorry. Um, but it's not a fundamental thing. You still go against the passwords because the passwords are still things that prevent access to certain systems or things that help identify a certain person. Like there's that, correlation between your email and your password. And if I know and I your email is public, so I just need to know your secret part, the, the password to get into a system. If I know the if I know those two things, I can get into that system and act as if I am you. I'm acting on your behalf. I'm doing this on your account. So for all intents and purposes, that system detects you as a legitimate user doing something that might be a bit off, might be a bit awkward, might be a bit different from what you usually do. Um, and if the system doesn't detect this kind of anomalous behavior, uh, that's where the bad guys can do whatever they want. And um, this thing hasn't changed much um, in recent years. It's just a matter of the techniques being used and the techniques being used to circumvent the potential solutions. Like the problem might be, for instance, that people use the same password everywhere because it's easier yeah. to remember. 
Sure. It's um, just the name of my so, dog. So I, I exactly. Whoops, I said that out loud. <laughs> your your birth date and uh I'm just whatever. kidding. So, my password is on this post-it note right here. Yeah, it's <laughs> exactly. Um so that idea that um the 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 current IT systems require users to create and remember a complex password, they'll just go through all lengths to to try and make it as easy to remember as possible while still abiding to the complexity requirements. Like you need um, you need a password. So I go with Bob. Now nah, you need uh, both uh, lowercase and uppercase letters. So then I put an uppercase B at, in the beginning. So now it's Bob with a capital B. No, you also need numbers. So I add a Bob one at the end and that's it. That's my password. Now you also need symbols. So I need to add an exclamation point or like a, an at sign or a dollar sign at the end. And uh, what people don't know is that this is the common way for for um, other uh, attackers to figure out what sort of password you might use based on the common uh, dictionary words or the common things that people usually put into their passwords. If I know something about you, if I know... Uh, the name of some of your uh, extended family members or mm. some favorite things that you like or the or name my, of your or dog. My dog. <laughs> exactly. Or or your birth date. I can use a combination of these things and then just add a zero one, zero two, zero three at the end. Like people usually do when they have to put in a new password. So they just put the old password and add a zero two at the end or whatever. And that's a new password. Yeah. Uh, the problem with this is if you use the same password everywhere, I don't need to hack your password here. I just need to find a way to hack that one system or that one application or that one website that's more vulnerable. And if I get your password from there, I can then reuse it anywhere mm -hmm. that anywhere else that you've used. Like, like my bank account. Exactly. So a lot of a lot of situations um, in recent years saw this very thing happen. A lot of uh, incidents, a lot of data breaches, where it wasn't the system itself that was vulnerable. It was that one user used the same password somewhere else. That location was hacked, and then the attackers, the bad guys, used the same login information to get access to the other system or application or website or whatever. So it wasn't that that website or that cloud provider or that application was hacked. It was that people just used um, the same password um, or a less complex password. Um, anywhere between, I think, in most hacks in, in recent years, um, people like security researchers tend to do um, statistics on like what's the most common password. And um, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. By the way, is in really? recent years, it is, it is, and in in a lot of cases, that amounts to somewhere between one and two percent of users. Wow. Like, you've got a, a website that's got ten million users, and it gets hacked, and people check what the passwords are, and two percent of those users, so that's one in fifty, use one, two, three, four, five, six. Wow. There's others that use one, two, three, four, five, or the the name of the website, or just really common passwords. So if if I have a chance of one in fifty that's to use one, two, three, four, five, thousands six, of users. that's exactly it's it's enough for me to get access. So I might not want to try all the passwords or the possible passwords for that one user. I could just try all the users. And use one, two, three, four, five, six as the password, and see how many of them I get. So, there's there's things that happen that way, and this has uh, shifted the types of attacks towards things like password spraying, where you don't try and hack one account with a lot of passwords. You just use one, two, three common passwords, and you try out all of the accounts, because now you've got a lot of systems that have a lockout mechanism. Like if you try three, four, five wrong passwords, you get locked out. So if I want to avoid that, I just try one password. I just try one, two, three, four, five, six. And if it doesn't work for this user, it might work for the next one. It's just 
every user in the system trying out one password from the system's perspective. It's not a, a bad guy trying to figure out a million passwords, a million different combinations for one password. So it's just the way the attacks change to adapt to the sort of solutions and uh, precautions that the, the system or the website puts to to try and prevent those kinds of attacks. But so, so where does the ethical hacker come into this to help prevent that? Uh, one is um, education, trying to help the the users and usually the companies, um, trying to help them understand how to make better use of the technology, how to mm -hmm. like, correctly uh, figure out a password policy, for instance, things like using multi-factor authentication or things like using a password manager and creating a random password for every website, not reusing the same password everywhere. And so some, of, some of those bits of advice are for the people yeah. that are maintaining the site and others exactly. are for the users who are creating the password. For the users. Exactly. So it's, it's both something that goes to helping improve or make better use of the technology behind things, uh, and others are targeted at, at the users themselves and making uh, them just helping them understand why a certain thing might be better off done in a certain way, like using a, or not reusing your password or using a more complex password using a password manager. So education is one thing. Technology solutions are another. Uh, doing some form of, say, audit um, or uh, it's, it's also sometimes called a penetration test where you try to get into a system, try to get into a, a website or a server or a network in the same way that a, a, a bad guy, a black hat hacker, if you will, would. Mm -hmm. And you try and figure out whether there's a way to get in. And if there is, it's better off for you to find it early than uh, waiting until one of the bad guys finds it. Usually with some automated tools left overnight, and by morning, they just check and see how many other servers and websites they've hacked overnight. Um, yeah. So, so you basically pretend to be the bad guy to exactly. find those vulnerabilities and then communicate those vulnerabilities back and to the company. Help, help implement solutions as well. All right. If All right. if the company can't uh, find a way to do to do it themselves, uh, or they don't have the the knowledge, the the time to do it, and so on. Um, I can help them um, do it as well. I can help either teach their team on how to do it so that they can do it in the future and manage it, or I can do it for them and tell them, hey, this is what I've done. If anyone else comes in and asks, you can tell them that this is this is what has been done. I see. Now, at the beginning of this conversation, you introduced yourself as a certified ethical hacker. Tell me about the certified part. Um, so it's... The, the certified part is just one of the well-known common certifications in the industry. Um, it's not the only one. There's a number of others. I just uh, went for this one because it sounds good. Right? <laughs> it does sound pretty cool. It, it's got the uh, words certified, yeah, ethical, exactly, and hacker. Exactly, pretty cool exactly. words in mind. Um, some of the others just sound a bit too technical. Um, and the, the certified part means that, yes, I went ahead, I took an exam, um, and it's the kind of exam that you spent, I think it was a four hour exam or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and one thing I like about, so the, the company behind the certification, uh, it's called EC council. One mm -hmm. of the things that they do is they also do a background check. If, if they mm -hmm. find that you might be too young to, to get like a 97% score on an exam, they will ask for your credentials or a, a background to prove that you do have those skills and you didn't just go out there and got like a brain dump, like a list of the answers off the internet and just came in, took the exam. That, that does not sound ethical. Um, yeah, it doesn't, but people do that with a lot of other exams. I know with Microsoft exams, that happens a lot. I'm right? shocked. Uh, yeah, everyone is. Everyone should be, right? <laughs> nobody, nobody knows that this is something that happens. So they they do want to to ensure that um, if people do get the certification, 
um, they they do have the credentials and the background and the knowledge to show for it. And it's one of those certifications that you can get renewed. I think it's every three years. Mm-hmm. And you have to uh, you have to provide proof that you've done stuff like attended conferences and given talks at conferences and published articles and things like that mm-hmm. so that you can keep that certification. Which you do a lot of. Which, yes, I do a lot of. So that means every three years I have to give them a list of all the stuff that I've done and they just extend that certification. There's another level, uh, which is a licensed pen tester. Uh, that goes um, through through the sole process where they give you access to an environment and they tell you you've got two weeks to like hack away at it and then give us a report and then you'll end up in sort of like an, an exam format with a uh, with a couple of people doing an assessment on what you wrote and asking you questions like like university like you you go in front of the teacher and you present like this is what i found this is the the audit report that that i ended up with here's what i did and those guys need to be uh, licensed pen testers as well, and they are the ones that will give you the certification. So it's more of a formal human kind of interaction right. with that. So that's that's one of the reasons I went I went with with this route. There's a lot of other certifications out there, um, and they're really I think just as good from a technical standpoint, um, and they're valid. And some of them are more like sought after from um, like a, a compliance perspective mm-hmm. like I, we need people uh with any sort of comp tia certification right. on security or like things like that but um i just went for this one because like i mentioned in the beginning it sounds better and it's easy to <laughs> explain um all three sides like certified means i i gave an exam that show that yes, I know some of these things. Mm-hmm. Ethical is the ethical part we talked about, and the hacker part we also talked about. So, yeah, very cool. Um, before I let you go, I want to ask you about IT Camp, which is uh, where I first met you. It's a conference that you've been running for, gosh, ten years maybe. Ten years, yeah. We should and have had the tenth edition. So the the uh, pandemic disrupted this whole thing. What's the status of it now? Uh, so right now it's on hold. Um, we are still looking at ways to have it in person safely. And th- it is the kind of experience that we've always seen as an in-person experience. It's it's more than just an online conference where people just come in and present stuff and maybe you've got some Q&A. It's, it's also about what happens during the breaks and um on on the like in between the sessions and not just during the sessions and you know since you've been there quite a few times the the sort of discussions that you have with people like after your session is over and during lunch and uh all throughout the day um the the fact that all the speakers um end up also attending other sessions because we try and find uh, interesting topics and uh, interesting uh, people to to bring in to to have them talk about those topics. I'll, I'll uh, interject that this was especially yeah. valuable for me uh, because I'm from nowhere near Romania. <laughs> I'm from the United States, and I got a chance to meet not only Romanians but also people from all over the world because it's very much an international conference, which was yeah. uh, really good for me. Yeah, so it's 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 something that we focused on since the beginning, and we're still looking at ways to see how we can uh, continue that in the future. Um, we're still looking at ensuring that it's an in-person event as much as possible, uh, or at least a hybrid event, because now that's becoming a thing. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it's certainly something that we want to to. Uh, resume at some point. We've had to cancel last year and this year, uh, and we're still not sure about next year with how things are looking okay. um, at this point. But um, that's yeah. fair. typically it's uh, late spring, early summer. I think is when you exactly turn have it. late May, early June. Um, that's and it's in Transylvania. Um, so 
it's it's easier to tell people instead of telling them it's in Cluj or it's in Romania, you just tell them Transylvania, and everybody's they, heard of Transylvania. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. which by the <laughs> way is a beautiful region. I just absolutely love Transylvania. Yeah, it is. Is there anything we haven't discussed that you think we should? Um, I'm not sure. I think, um. Maybe maybe stuff about how people are um, treating security during the pandemic and how the the pandemic has changed that, because I think that's um, that's one of the most common topics I I discuss nowadays with people. Like, is there something about the the pandemic that has changed or shifted in the way of how we do security or how we handle security? Well, um, well, we're almost at time, but uh, if if you have a, a quick elevator pitch about what's different yeah sure then, it's, then we, can, um, we can make this another conversation go in depth i mean sure it's it's certainly something that uh is to be kept in mind that yes the the pandemic has changed the way we look at security the way we look at remote work and how do we ensure that people say working from home uh have the same level of security on their devices and on the systems that they work from or connect to as they used to do back they back when they were in the office. Right. So that's certainly one one challenge that that came with this. The the challenge of finding yourself with a lot of people working remotely overnight and your VPN connection not being enough for all of them to to do whatever wow. they were doing back in the office. So it's um it's a lot of stuff around that it's a lot of exploits and attacks around the the pandemic itself and trying to trick people into clicking links based on the current latest events right so there's been a lot of attacks of, of that sort but it's mostly both people working from home and the it staff working from home and not being there when stuff happens and um, not being always present and always monitoring everything like they would back when they would work from the office. That's also affecting the, the way attacks work. It's easier to start an attack on times that you know people are going to be off hours and away and uh, just do whatever you want to do without getting caught. So yes, there's there's been changes and there's been solutions to that as well and approaches to that as well. But um, um, it's certainly a shift that that a lot of people are seeing and a lot of people went as far as trying to figure out on their own what they can do better when it comes to security. It's it's also about personal security and the the way I usually talk about this in. Um, um, in any trainings or like with with people that I, I discuss a topic with, it's more important for people to understand how security affects them on a personal level, because that's when they will put in the effort to ensure that the like company data and company devices are just as secure. Because once mm -hmm. you know certain things and once you know how security can affect you personally, it's stuff that you can't ignore anymore wherever you right. go work or wherever you go like on vacation or like using a personal device and using a work device is just the same as long as you know what could happen it's hard to ignore it in a personal or professional um environment i'll tell you what this sounds like a really deep topic and so i'm, I'm going to cut you off there and let's uh, let's talk about this in a few months and uh because i think we can go dive sure. deep in it. it sounds really fascinating i i, I would i, I would it'll give us a it'll give us an excuse to chat again which we don't do often enough I would love that. And in the meantime, Tudi, thank you so much for your time and uh, you stay safe. Yeah, thank you. You too. When it comes to technology, um, it's rarely about the the tools and the applications and it's always more about the friends you make along the way and the the things you learn from them and with them. Technology always changes, but friends will stay with you um, for for a lot more. <laughs>